Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Gene, so good to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, you started about a decade ago, maybe around 2010, 2011, to start really noticing some changes in college students and teenagers. Do you want to tell us about that? I think it was your findings at that time, all those years ago, that first sort of alerted me to your work. Yeah, you know, I've been doing this stuff on generational differences for a long time, about 25 years. Mm -hmm. So my first book, Generation Me, was about the millennials and a lot of the individualism and self-confidence that that shaped them. Um, And I started working with some of these, you know, big, national surveys, um, mostly you know, high school seniors is one of the populations, 17 and 18 year olds. And um, I started to notice some really unusual trends. You know, I, I had gotten used to seeing generational shifts, but they, they mm-hmm. take a decade or two to roll out. Then with um, the teens in yeah about 2011, 2012, 2013, that data started to show some unusual trends that more and more teens started to say that they felt left out and they felt lonely that they felt like they couldn't do anything right, that they didn't enjoy life. And those last two are classic symptoms of depression. Um, and, it, and it kept going. It wasn't just a year or two. Then those trends kept building and they showed up in other you know, national data sets on clinical level depression, on self-harm behaviors, um, on suicide attempts, you know, very serious issues in teen mental health. And I had I'd really never seen anything like it, that the, these changes were so large and, and so sudden. Um, so, you know, first seemed clear that there was a new generational transition, that millennials were not going to last until those born in 1999 or 2002, as some people had theorized, that we already had they were there. The post-millennial generation had already arrived um, among teens and, and um, as time went on, young adults as well, that there was this noticeable shift. And I mentioned the mental health things, but there were also some noticeable shifts in values, um, in personality traits, in self-esteem, life satisfaction. And just across the board, there was the most sudden generational shift I had ever seen in my whole career. Wow. And so you call this post-millennial generation iGen. They're sometimes called Generation Z, um, depending on on what you're reading. Can you, you broke down a little list there at the end. Um, values shifted, uh, personality traits shifted. What else did you say? Also, uh, I'd, I'd just love for you to break it down a little bit further. What is so different about this emerging generation? Yeah, well, it's it's a really long list. Yeah, um, we got time. So, this is know, long my, form it, podcasting. So yeah, I'm absolutely, curious. Absolutely, right? Um, mm. Yeah, so so my you know my my book on this in, on this group is called iGen, and it discusses ten different trends um, that that show up, um, and you know some of them are are things that are trends that have continued from the millennial generation, or even have been going on since Gen X or the Boomers. They just kind of keep going, but then mm-hmm. there's these others that are these really sudden shifts. So they're really you know the most sudden shift is in terms of optimism versus pessimism. So millennials were, and I think for the most part still are, very optimistic, self-confident, at least as teens, um, were pretty happy and satisfied with life. I mean, they showed some interesting patterns in terms of mental health with some more kind of psychosomatic symptoms of depression. But at least on the surface, a lot of the trends are pretty positive. Um, they had very high expectations, high self-esteem, even narcissism, you know, yeah. higher entitlement, all of those things. And then 
it, it changed. So some of those things like entitlement and narcissism started to change around the time of the great recession. But then for mental health and happiness and life satisfaction and optimism, it happened later around 2012 or so that sudden shift toward, I mean, the, the graphs are just amazing. So this is mm. why I put like a hundred graphs in iGen in the book, just because it, it, it just captures it. They're, they're just shocking to see, you know, life satisfaction, for example, among 17 and 18 year olds, um, been measured since the 1970s in this big survey. So we have it all the way back to the boomers and it just, it steadily goes up. And then, you know, it, it had the millennials who are very satisfied uh, and it peaks around 2011 or 2012. And then it just goes it just off a cliff, falls off a cliff, like very uh, dissatisfied with life. Crazy. You never see trends like this, right? You just sure. don't see them. It just, uh, the things being so sudden. Um, and that's just one example. You see the same for expectations for self-esteem, um, what happened to expectations? Did they go higher or lower? Depression. Right. So, so yeah. So life satisfaction goes down. Happiness goes down. Self-esteem went down. Uh, and then on the other side, then the stuff like depression and self-harm and suicide rate, opposite thing that that goes way up. So all consistent with each other. So, you know, as opposed to the millennials where you, sometimes you had some facets of depression going up, some going down, you know, some optimism, but then, you know, some underlying, um, you know, dissatisfaction in, in, in some areas, you know, it's kind of a mixed picture with millennials, mostly, you know, tending toward optimism. iGen is just really, really consistent. All these things going in this direction and more pessimism, less life satisfaction, less happiness, more depression, um, just much more negative, um, you know, and in a very sudden, um, shift that was really unprecedented. Wow. And how, so you started to notice these a decade ago, have those trends held consistent? Um, because now this is the thing, and we have a bunch of iGen, Gen Z listeners to this podcast, you know, they're not just high school kids anymore. They're college kids. They're, what is the line, uh, just for clarification's sake, in your view, the approximate year range for iGen? When right. were they born starting from when to when? Yeah, so I define iGen or Gen Z as those born between 1995 and 2012. Okay. So, you know, admittedly, any birth year cutoff is arbitrary. So the way mm. generations work, you know, there's always people debating, you know, for example, for millennials, at least, did they start in 1980 or did they start in 1982? And like, yeah. people will fight to the death over these two years, right? <laughs> um and I think, I think it, it, it doesn't matter a ton. You know, some people like the Pew Research Center for Gen Z, you know, they cho I think they chose 1997. Um, but I don't know. I think if you, look at, if you look at the patterns in the data, it's somewhere in the mid-90s very, very clearly. It's okay. one of the few times when you can see a very clear generational break. Um, because between Gen X and millennials, it's much more arbitrary. There's not a really super clear generational break in these trends. But there is between millennials and I gen or okay, Gen so Z. It, super it, it is there. Like in the mid nineties, this yeah. is when you start to see kids born then yeah. really now. How has that tracked yeah. into 2021? Are they still pessimistic, mm -hmm. low life satisfaction, more prone to depression, low self-esteem? What what are you seeing today? We don't know yet. Um, there's a lag in oh. in these these national the national data coming out. Right. Um, and I, I, a couple of times uh, in 2020, I, I was able to team up with some folks um, from the Wheatley Institution at BYU and also from um, the Institute for Family Studies. They funded a few studies. So we were able to get a few samples for, for mental health among teens um, during 2020. But, um, and here's the issue hmm. you know, we teamed up with really great national survey companies. However, we had to get to people through their parents, just, you know, morally and ethically, that's the only way to do it during a pandemic when you can't do the survey at school. So we were probably missing a lot of kids who maybe mm. weren't connected to their parents. So I am not 100% confident that we know yet. Um, I am really waiting for that national data to come out in a few months to try to see a more comparable 2020 versus 2019. Um, so 
we tried, we tried our best, but you know, I won't be fully confident until we have the government sponsored, uh, data sets coming out. No, I appreciate that. And just, you know, in case people miss the intro, you are actually a researcher. You don't just go out and do a, a you know, a Facebook survey right. and it's like, Hey, you know, Instagram poll, are you depressed? Are you not like this is peer reviewed right. level research. Okay. Well, as it yeah. was 2019, right. the year you last had reliable data then that you would say, yeah, yeah. we had what was it like yeah. in 2019? Did you see the trends in 2012 continue yeah. into 2019 or did they adjust somehow? Yeah. Yeah. So they have continued, if not accelerated. Wow. So, so that has been, yeah, that's been the really stunning thing that it wasn't, for example, that, you know, there's this spike, you know, 2012, 2013, and then it just like, plateaued. It's not what it looks like. It keeps hmm. going up. So, so it wasn't so, middle school. For example. No. It wasn't just middle school. It wasn't like, oh, they had a bad middle school, junior high experience, yes, and right. now they're fine right. as young adults. No. Right. Right. Yeah. So the, the um, one great example is the national level data on clinical level depression, because there we've got all the age groups, same method, really solid, lots of, you know, big sample size, all that good stuff. And we can look at 12 to 17 year olds. So we're getting, you know, so say seventh graders, you know, up to 12th graders. And then uh, we can all, all, they also have young adults. So 18 to 25 year olds. So we can look at those trends across all those age groups and see what's going on. Um, so in that data, for 12 to 17 year olds, you see that in 2011 or so, the rate for clinical level depression is about 8% hmm. approximately. And then it starts to climb you now after about 2012, 2013. And it keeps going every single year, pretty much it gets higher and higher and higher until 2019 when it was 16%. So it doubled. And that's statistically so huge, right? That's not just like it a small variation. Normal. You just never, you never see things like that, right. um, that it doubled. It's crazy. And just for context, this is not overdiagnosis. This is mm. not people being more willing to seek help. Because this is what's called a screening study. They get a cross section of the whole population because they want to make they want to see well what's the prevalence in the population whether they're getting help or not. That's the whole purpose of this type of study. It's called the um, National Study of Drug Use and Health. That's what they're trying to do. So it's you, you can't explain it away hmm. um, with those types of explanations. You also can't say oh they're just more willing to admit to problems. Well, if that were the case, you wouldn't see it in behaviors like self harm and suicide, and you do. And those data look exactly the same. That you see that increase beginning. So it actually begins a little earlier in those and the behaviors, but then also just keeps going, keeps up and up and up pretty much every year. Uh, then for young adults, so for young adults, it takes a little longer. It's more like 2013 or 2014 when it first starts to tick up. Then it, it goes up even faster than for teens. So by 2019, their level of clinical level depression has reached the same level as teens. So it also doubled or almost doubled and in an even shorter period of time. And you know why was there de the delay? I think because it was a generational effect. It took another few years for iGen to be in that group of 18 and 25 year olds. And we're seeing it there too among young adults. Mm. And 26 and over, so that's gonna be you know millennials, Gen X, you don't see it as much. It's not as prevalent there. Um, you see it a little bit among the people in their late 20s, a little bit of an uptake, but not much. For the most part, you're not seeing, at least in terms of depression, the same increases um, among uh, those who are uh, in other generations. You're not seeing it as much for them over the last few years. It's the teens and young adults. So we're going to camp on why a lot, but before we go there, because everybody would be like, you know, we got a lot of parents listening and they're like, wow, these are my kids or a lot of leaders who's like, oh man, these are the people that are stepping into the workforce now. And I'm beginning to see that. But one more stat that really caught my eye, you say that Gen Z, iGen is a very safe generation statistically. In other words, not likely to get murdered, not as likely, like they, we live pretty safe lives, COVID notwithstanding. Yet anxiety is at an all-time high. That's a really fascinating paradox. How does that happen and what does that mean, Gene? Yeah. So one of the graphs that I made for the book, um, every once in a while, 
I'll just kind of stumble across something where I'm like, wow, that really shows what's going on. So one thing I did was graph the homicide rate for young people and the suicide rate for young people. So historically, the homicide rate has almost always been higher, in some cases considerably higher than the suicide rate. Hmm. So the 1990s. So I'm a Gen Xer. That's when I was a teen and young adult. Um, and that was a terrible time for violent crime. And that homicide rate is just like, I mean, you graph it, it's sky high. It looks like unemployment during the Great Depression. You know, it's just hmm. really, really high. Suicide was also fairly high during that time, too. But as you transition from millennials to iGen, what you get, really interesting patterns. So the homicide rate starts to fall, and it really, really plummets. But the suicide rate's going up, so the lines cross. So for iGen, almost the whole time iGen's been in this age group, the suicide rate's higher than the homicide rate. And that shows up across the board. It's not just those extreme outcomes. Hmm. It's also that in terms of physical safety, iGen is probably the safest generation in American history, physically, outside of the, the mental health piece like suicide. And we'll come mm -hmm. back to that. Mm -hmm. They're less likely to get hurt in car accidents, as one example. Um, it's not just the, the murder rate. It's also they're less likely to get in any kind of physical fight. Mm -hmm. And that's across two, two different data sets we know. That. I guess there's a CDC youth risk survey. It's one of the best sources of, of data on teens and their behaviors. That shows that much less likely to get in a physical fight at school, bring a weapon to school, all of that. All of that peaked in the 90s. So as parents and as a society, we've done a fantastic job keeping these kids safe. Hmm. It's just we have what might be a trade-off that in keeping them physically safe, they are not as emotionally safe. Hmm. That, for example, that I think there's a, I think there's a lot of things going on, but there's here's here's two possibilities. Um, in teens not being granted as much independence and not wanting as much independence and not doing as much independently and having they don't really have as much responsibility in terms of jobs or housework or any of those things compared to previous generations. They have those responsibilities for schoolwork that has its own challenges, but you know, we're just, we're not treating adolescents as adults as much as we used to. Mm. And we'll get to that in a second, that teens are taking longer to grow to adulthood. It's just kind of the way the economy works, the way the society works now. That has big upsides in terms of physical safety, for example, but it has the potential downside um, that might impact their mental health. That if they are not feeling useful, that that may have a negative impact on mental health. Then the other piece is, well, one reason that they're not getting in fights and to be blunt, you know, they're not killing each other is they're not with each other in mm. person as much as they used to. And this was, this was true even before the pandemic. So teens are now much less likely to hang out with their friends, to go to parties, um, to go out without their parents. You know, if, it, if it's about face-to-face -face social interaction, it started to decline around 2000, but only by a little bit. And then again, right around 2012, the exact same time, just another fall off a cliff in terms of how often they're getting together with their friends face to face. So that can be great for physical safety because they're not out driving around with their friends getting in car accidents and yeah. they're not hitting each other. Um, right. But yeah. it's also not great for mental health to be stuck in your room only communicating with your friends via text or Instagram or TikTok. Um, you know, you can stay in touch with your friends constantly and that seemingly keeps you connected, but it is not as good for mental health as actually being in the same room with your friends. Yeah. Okay. So that is, is super helpful. Do you think some of it is uh, parenting style? I mean, we've lived through so many metaphors of parenting, but helicopter parenting, parents who want to protect their kids, get them into the right schools, coddle them from all the consequences of their action. You know, you, you can joke and I'm, I'm barely a Gen Xer. So depending on how you slice it, uh, one of the oldest Gen Xers around. But like if I was in trouble at school, man, my parents sided with the teacher. And we tried to embody that with our kids as well. Once in a while, the teacher was wrong and that's a separate issue. 
But these days, you know, teachers almost feel like fear the parent because, you know, what are you doing to my kid? That kind of thing. Is parenting involved? Like what, what would you, what's your take on that? I could be totally wrong on that one, but I'm just curious. Yeah. You know, I, I think that may have had more of an impact on millennials. So there, there, but there, there absolutely was that trend toward, you know, my kid can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell my kid that they're special and they can be anything they want to be and so on. And what you tend to get with that type of parenting, um, as, as, you know, as positives, kids who are self-confident taken too far, what you get is entitlement and narcissism. However, I think that that shifted. Um, I think that style of parenting with the parents of millennials was focused on encouragement, Mm. um, sometimes too much. And then it shifted. I think it shifted from encouragement to fear. And then the parents of Gen Z or iGen shifted to more of that fear-based parenting. So it had some of the same characteristics in terms of protection, maybe even overprotection, but it had this undercurrent of fear to it that I think came across to their, to their kids. Hmm. So as one example, and millennials experienced this as well, but I think it kind of brought to a, it got, um, take a next level with Gen Z or iGen. Uh, around income inequality, of this idea that you either make it or you don't, so you better make it. And I mm. think that anxiety did um, get passed on to kids. Now, I think it's pretty unlikely that that would explain the big uptick in depression, partially based on timing, because that trend had been in place for a while, and we didn't start to see the uptick in depression until 2012. If that had really been it, I think it would have started earlier. But I, I do think there was a little bit of a shift in parenting. But I think we also massively overestimate the impact of parenting on mental health of teens. Hmm. You know, obviously, you know, relationship with parents is super important. But as long as that relationship is stable and loving, then, and that's probably even more the case for iGen than it was for previous generations, they get along with their parents great. They're, they're very wanted children for the most part. Um, you know, having kids now is a choice. So, you know, it is stable and loving and, and, and fairly consistently. As long as you have that, some of those things around, you know, overprotection or helicopter or so on, yeah, they're going to have an influence, but they're not going to be huge. Hmm. Um, you know, how that kid spends their time and the food they're eating and whether they're getting exercise and whether they're sleeping and whether they're seeing their friends face to face and, you know, what happened on Instagram last week with their friends, that's going to have a, often a bigger impact as, as gotcha. long as they have that basic relationship with their kids. If they don't, you know, then we're talking about classic stuff around, you know, parent, child and abuse and so on that are really not uh, generational shifts as much as just, you know, things that happen in every generation. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's super clarifying. Yeah. Because I do notice when you said we've raised our kids are in their twenties now, but we have by your definition, a millennial and a iGen or Gen Z. Um, And it's funny because I did see a lot more fear. We live in the country, but our kids played out in the backyard. A lot of young parents today, afraid to put their kids in the backyard, afraid to leave them unsupervised, that kind of thing. So you're talking about that kind of like worry over your children. I think, I think that's part of it. Um, I think there's a couple of, of societal trends that go into this. So one is just, you know, we've shifted as a society to protecting kids more mm. because and I think we have to put it in larger context. It's not that parents woke up one day and said, oh, you know, I'm not going to let my kids play in the backyard. Right. It's that, no, if you let your kid, you know, say your 10 year old walk home from the park for a mile you know, CPS might get called. Correct. Because that that's actually happened. Um, there's a whole shift in the societal scene. There are laws in some states. I believe in Illinois, you're not allowed under the law officially to leave your kid alone in the house until they're 16. Really? So this has been codified in the law in some cases. Wow. Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, and, th- and it's not just the U.S. either. Um, in there's There's places... I mean, so New Zealand is an interesting example. That's a culture that you know has a lot of rural stuff going on. It has a lot of a real, a huge independent streak. 
uh, I took my daughter who was 12 at the time in a hotel in New Zealand. And there was a card in the room that said that she could not go anywhere in the hotel by herself unless she was 14. And wow. we traveled all kinds of places. We just come from Hawaii and she would go to the beach and the pool by herself and come back and nobody cared. And it was especially strange that it was New Zealand, which is such a great country and has, you know, much, mm -hmm. you know, more relaxed attitude in general. But, you know, they, these things are, are happening over and over. Um, so it's not that that all parents want to participate. It's that, that's that we're often forced to. Um, so there's there's that going on, too. And I, I, I do think that, you know, there has been a shift in, in attitudes as well. So that's one piece of it. But you have to say, well, why? You know, why do we protect kids now more? Um, and one reason, and this also gets to the root of some of the other trends around Gen Z or iGen, is that the whole developmental trajectory has slowed. People mm. are growing up more slowly um, over the whole lifespan. So younger kids are less independent than they used to be. School age kids, less likely to walk home from school. Teens, less likely to get their driver's license or have a job um, or have sex or drink alcohol. Um, all these things that, you know, Gen Xers like me were doing with abandon in the 80s and, mm. and 90s. Um, so it's called a slow life strategy. When people live longer, when healthcare is better, when education takes longer to finish, parents tend to make the choice to have fewer children, nurture them more carefully, and have them grow up more slowly. And that's, mm. that's the way we live now. Um, and that wasn't always the case. You know, mid-20th yeah, yeah. century, it was a more, it was, you know, fast life strategy. People would have a lot of kids and just hope it worked out. That's how you used to do it. And now that's different. You're reminding me of two things. Number one, being five years old, my dad sending me to the corner store to buy him cigarettes by myself. And, right. you know, yeah, that's the, like, the, yeah. The, and not, yeah. Yeah, we never did that right. with not our kids. Coke, cigarettes. He'd be horrified yeah. knowing that now. Right. And he eventually quit smoking. But hey, that was the 60s, right? That's the way it was. And, uh, or totally. the 70s, yeah, whenever totally. that was. And then I, I still remember, I have a degree in history, um, I think it was James or, uh, yeah, John Stuart Mill, the philosopher, uh, son of James Mill had mastered Greek by the age of three. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like we're trying to figure out ABCs. Like I'm still trying to figure out my ABCs, but yeah, there is that, like, I, I, I like how you put that. What, okay. Now to the big question, why this spike? And this is where you've spent a lot of your research over the last 10 years. And I think you had that article in The Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of went viral um, and a number of other talks and, and so on. But why the massive change? There are a couple of factors, but yeah. I think your argument is there's a big one. Yeah. And I think I think there is more, more than one for sure. Um, but yeah, the more and more, it absolutely looks like there is at least probably a primary cause. So at first, when these big increases in depression and unhappiness and started to show up in a big decline in life satisfaction, I had no idea what was mm. going on. You know, I, I the first couple of years, I look at this and went, what the heck? Like you water know, supply, it, it really the wasn't air quality, so like what, right? <laughs> like, Yeah. So. When you think this through, you have to think of something that changed. It can't be just, you know, what are the usual causes of depression? Well, you know, genetic predisposition. Well, that's not going to change in two or three years or even 10 years. Right. So you have to think about overall, what's changing? That's your challenge. So, you know, when you do cultural change research, sometimes you go, okay, is it the economy? Well, no, that's actually completely misaligned. So you get that beginning around 2012. Well, 2012 to 2019, that was a great period for the economy. You had economic expansion. The unemployment rate was steadily going down. You know, it's exactly the opposite of what you'd expect for economic trends for people to become more depressed. You know, plus these are teens we're talking about here. You know, we're we're not talking about people who are supporting themselves. You know, usually economic factors aren't going to be as big as it would be for adults anyway. But still. Totally the opposite direction of what you'd expect. Okay, so you have to go elsewhere. Well, okay, I thought you know, any any events that occurred around 2012 that hadn't been there bef as much before and then accelerated through 2019. It's tough to think of anything. Um, it, there, there really is very little that fits that description. 
and that the few that do tended to be more isolated in their effects. So mm -hmm. the opioid epidemic is a good example. So that did start around that time. However, mostly affected adults, not teens. You go, okay, maybe it's their parents, but was mostly in, in certain areas and not others. Yet these increases in, in depression for teens are showing up everywhere mm -hmm. across racial and ethnic groups, socioeconomic status, region of the country, everything. Pretty uniform. So it doesn't seem likely that could be it. Um, and so I puzzled over this for a really, really long time. And then I found uh, a poll from the Pew Center for Research. It turns out the end of 2012 was the first time that the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. Mm. And then you look at teens themselves. That was also around the time that social media use moved from optional to mandatory. So there's no exact definition for that. But in 2009, only about half of 12th graders were on social media every day. And by 2017, it was about 85%. Wow. So I think there's kind of a tipping point there. You get about, I don't know, around 75%. Then if you're not on social media, you're left out. Yeah. So that was a big transition too. Partially because social media is social. It doesn't just affect the people who use it. It affects the people who don't use it. Because hmm. then if you're not on it, you're left out. And if you are on it, well, then you might still be left out because, say, your friends went to a party, posted pictures on Instagram, and you weren't invited. So there's these elements. And then social comparison and body image issues and that it displaces time for other things. There's all these things going on. And it affects you whether you use it or not. Hmm. So the other thing that happened is that shift that we, we touched on earlier. Teens started spending a lot more time online and a lot less time with each other face to face and a lot less time sleeping. Mm. And that is a terrible formula for mental health because mm. you're spending less time on things that are very good for mental health, face to face social interaction in real time and sleeping. And you're spending a lot more time on something that is either negative or maybe some people think it's a wash. Even if you think that spending a lot of time online is a wash for mental health, you still could get this negative effect mm. uh, because it's displacing time for other things. And what I'm often asked at this point is, how can you be sure that it's smartphones and social media causing depression rather than the other way around? Mm. Well, among individuals, it could be either one. And we can talk about that. But when we're talking about the trends over time at the generational level, I think it's extremely clear that it's the technology leading to depression rather than the other way around. Right. Because if you make the argument that it's depression leading to the technology is, you'd have to say teens became depressed for some completely unknown reason nobody's been able to figure out even 10 years later. And then that caused them to buy smartphones and spend mm. more time on social media. That seems extremely unlikely. It seems much more likely that this technology became popular, especially among teens. They started to use it more. It kind of took over, had these after effects on how they were spending their time. And then that led to depression. And that's exactly how the data looks. We did this more sophisticated statistical analysis once and matched it up. And there's about a year delay. Um, the technology comes first, then the depression. Mm. Yeah. And you know what, having read your research and, uh, and some of your writing, your talks, I, I buy that. So I'm not, I'm not going to argue with that because I want to unpack what that means. So we've got a lot of iGen, Gen Z listening. We have younger millennials listening, got a lot of Gen X and some boomer bosses listening. And now we're onboarding this generation out of college into the workplace one of the things I've heard a lot of leaders say, and I've experienced this to some extent in my own life, having a pretty young team, both at the church when I worked there and, and at times in my company as well, is that often this generation doesn't emerge with life skills. Do you agree with that? That there's a little more nurturing on behalf of employers and bosses and leaders that has to happen with this next generation? And then if so, what, is, what does that look like, Gene? What do we need to do? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, to put this in context, there's some big upsides, um, for iGen, um, coming into the workplace. So they have a, they have a strong work ethic. 
um, you know, even compared to previous generations, it's, it's stronger than say, you know, young people 10 years ago. Um, they're very practical. They are lower in narcissism and entitlement. Um, so there's, there's some big upsides with this group, but they are psychologically and in terms of their life experience younger Hmm. than previous generations when they're graduating high school, when they're graduating college. So say coming out of high school. So I work in higher education, college faculty. Um, and this is the main, I think one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenges in higher education today that kids are coming to college without as much life experience, without as much experience with independence specifically. Mm. So, you know, they may not have gone out of the house without their parents all that much or had a job um, or had much experience with sex or alcohol. And there's some big positives to that. But then they get to college and boom, they have to do all of that. Um, And it's like going zero to 60 in a short period of time. And they have those experiences often when they're away from home for the first time, very challenging. Yeah. And then that happens again in the workplace because college faculty and staff have a harder job. You know, we, we feel that we need to bring them further in four years than we used to because they're coming to us with less independence. Uh, often what I hear a lot from, um, college faculty and staff is they see a lot of students are more trouble making decisions mm-hmm. probably because they didn't have experience with making decisions. And I always want to be clear. I'm saying this in terms of empathy, not criticism. Correct. That yeah. you know, this is the world I you love my younger came team. into. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and I I think you know if you if you do happen to be older and you put yourself in the shoes of someone who has not had those life experiences, oh my gosh, that is hard. That is mm-hmm. so hard to come from that background, just not having had those experiences, and then have to make these decisions and have independence. Um, I think that would happen to any generation. I don't think it's a sign of weakness. It's just a sign of how we live now that there's these challenges. And that's just, it's really, really hard. So, you know, we see that at the college level and we have to try to bring them farther. Um, And we're doing the best we can. So bosses, you know, we're not, we're trying really hard not to coddle them, but sometimes we we almost feel like we have to because they're coming to us with, you know, these, these um, just, fewer experiences with independence, decision-making and so on. Um, and we're trying to get them there, but can't always do that. And, mm. and it varies also from one campus to another, you know, on some campuses that is, that is honestly, you know, to criticize, you know, some folks in my own field, apologies, but I think there has been, you know, a little too much um, coddling in some cases of, you know, Oh, you can take that exam whenever you want. Um, well, what's going to happen when you say, well, you know, okay, so here's an example. And I said no to this, but a lot of folks don't at the college level. I had a kid say, I, you know, I have to take the final late because I'm going to Vegas for my birthday. I'm like, <laughs> oh, really? Well, we've got okay. 300 other people in this class and I can't give, you know, 200 makeup exams. So, you know, that's not really a valid excuse, dude. Um, very Californian now after 20 years here. <laughs> so my thought always with these things, so I, I'm mostly teaching upper division undergraduates, you know, in two weeks, they might be in spring semester in two weeks, they might be on a job in a, a real job starting their careers. Um, and this is always my thought. What would the boss say? Right. If you said, oh, I can't make the big presentation because I'm going to Vegas for my birthday. No, or you're fired or some version of that. Right. Right. Um, so I think about that a lot. I don't want to be the mean professor. Um, you know, I teach psychology. I try to have very open discussions and, and, you know, have empathy as much as possible. On the other hand, and I think about this as a parent as well of, of um, teens and, and two younger kids too, that I'm, you know, I got to prepare them. I have to prepare them for what's coming. So as a parent, you know, you're not raising children, you're raising adults. Hmm. And as a college professor, you're not just teaching college students, you're teaching future workers. And the reality is, you know, they are going to have to be prepared for that world. And too often, I think, as parents, we're not preparing them for that world. As teachers, we're not. Um, and I think that that can be that can be a problem when they end up in, in the workplace, you know, with some of these attitudes and lack of experience that 
is not going to serve them well. I think it's a huge challenge for this generation and for leaders. Without saying too much or being inappropriate, how did that conversation go with the student who wanted to go to Vegas for his birthday or her birthday? Like, did, did you end up in a good place yeah. with that or? Um, well, um, the way most of these conversations go is that I just have to say no. Yeah. Um, and what I almost always do, oh, but my other professors let me do it. I'm like, okay, great. You know, that's, that's them. Um, so yeah, it doesn't always go great. Um, but I just have to hold my ground and say, look, I'm trying to be fair to everyone. Right. Cause that's the other value system here. Really? Yeah. Um, so, and there's no one right answer to this. The whole makeup exam things is you get any professor talking about it and you'll get 10 different opinions. Um, but in, in, in my view, you know, you, there are situations where you absolutely have to make accommodations. And then there's some that are a little bit more of a gray area, or in this case, a seriously, you really asked me that category. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it is. Okay. So, Go ahead. If there's more, I've, I've, I've got to so no, many no, no, that was basically it. Yeah. Um, so for students who are listening and you do have a number of like thousands of people in that demographic you're describing who are listening right now, what would you say to them? It's like, you know, you're merging into life. They're over 18, 18 to 24 is the second biggest demographic for this podcast. So, you know, the merging into life, they're, they're going to get a job. They're trying to get into grad school, whatever they're doing. Um, what would some tips be for them? Because they're probably feeling like you heard them and understand them and they're like, okay, so now what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just, just to put things in, in, in context, um, I always want to make sure that people are understanding where I'm coming from when it comes to talking about generational differences, because there is absolutely a natural defensiveness when you hear somebody older talking about your generation. True. I vividly remember what that was like um, as a young Gen Xer, and especially the baby boomers talking about us. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, as an older Gen Xer, I um, felt the same how defensiveness. How dare you criticize us? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a natural defensiveness. So I, I totally, absolutely get that. Um, so in my view, the best way to uh, get around the danger of you know stereotyping a generation I'm not a member of is to try to rely on the voices and opinions um, and responses of the generation themselves. So the data that I've been discussing is not based on older people observing the generation. It's based from younger people themselves, you know, on surveys and interviews and other sources, um, what they say uh, about how they're feeling, their values, what's important to them in life, how they're spending their time, all of those things. Um, all of it's self-report. All of it is from these generations themselves. And we're comparing their experiences to previous generations when they were young. So that's the other thing I think happens too often in generational stuff is, you know, do a survey and find some stuff. Well, maybe that's just because people are young. Right. So taking that perspective of, you know, this isn't stereotyping. And in my view, it's listening. It's listening to what young people have to say, you know, from as many sources as possible. But you have to be clear eyed about the challenges, the advantages and disadvantages of, of your group. Um, that, so in, in, you know, talking to, um, college students and, and young workers in this group, you know, I think it's, it's important to, uh, you know, recognize your strengths that your generation has a lot of amazing strengths. Um, I mentioned work ethic. I think also, um, how fantastically, wonderfully inclusive this generation is. Uh, they are just cool with, no matter who you are, they're pretty cool with it. Um, huge strength. So keep those in mind, hold those close, um, even as things feel challenging. 
And I think there is a very strong belief among this generation that the world is a difficult place, that the world is an unkind place. Try to take a step back from that and put it in context and think, well, wait, are things actually worse now than they were for boomers getting drafted into Vietnam or Gen Xers at the height of the crime wave or millennials graduating into the Great Recession? You know, is it really that bad? And then, you know what? Even if it is really that bad, let's focus on what I can do, on what I can control, on the opportunities I can seek, uh, and the things that I can do to make my life better. And this is another strength of iGen. They're often looking at not just how can I make my life better, how can I make life better for everyone? Hmm. So altruism and wanting to help has increased uh, among young people in the last five to 10 years. So that's another huge strength is that this generation is looking to help others, looking to make the world a better place. Uh, And as always, there's big challenges in doing that, but they have that at their core. Oh, that's good to know. Any idea why the work ethic is higher? I think the Great Recession was uh, a little bit of a reality check. Mm -hmm. Um, And that kind of made young people realize, you know, that things are not always going to be easy in the workplace, that they can't always have the high pay, but then also not work as many hours because that was a disconnect that happened a lot uh, when millennials were young. Um, I also think it's a byproduct of the decline in optimism. So there's trade-offs. There's trade-offs in in a lot of these viewpoints that, you know, pessimism sounds like it would be all bad and, you know, it's not great, but you could also take it as being realism. That, you know, that's what you could say. A a lot of pessimists make that argument and they have a point. Uh, Am I being pessimistic or am I being realistic? And I think that's where some of the work ethic comes from of kind of moving away from, from this idea of, oh, I can get all this stuff without having to work for it. of just, you know, maybe coming away from some of that unrealistic optimism and saying, yeah, I know I'm going to have to work for this. How do we live with our smartphones? Cause they're not going away. How do we optimize? Yeah. I mean, most of us have had the advice, you know, limit your screen time, get out, do physical exercise. Is it that simple? Like just the self-discipline to do those things or is it deeper than that, Gene? Yeah. Well, you know, these are hard, these are hard issues for a bunch of reasons. So one is that smartphones are awesome. You know, there are so many amazing, wonderful things that we can do with them. Um, Social media, not quite as overall positive, but even that there's a lot of social activism and keeping in touch with people that, you know, it's hard to do any other way. There's huge advantages to these technologies. However, um, it is a very tough thing to put that self-control and regulation solely on the individual, particularly for social media, because social media was designed to be addictive. You know, there's really no other way to put it. And that some of the folks who founded these companies admit to this. So Sean Parker, one of the founders of Facebook, said Facebook exploits our vulnerability in human psychology, but we did it anyway. And that's the business model um, Mm -hmm. of, and not just Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, all of them, get people coming back as much as possible for as often as possible, because that's how they make the most money. So when we as individuals try to resist this, it is really hard. And I think there's a lot of people who think it's just them who find it hard to put down the phone, find it hard to put, put away the social media. It's not, we're all in this together. We're all being sucked into it. It's, it's how it works. So, um, it's a huge challenge. I do think there are some really straightforward, concrete steps. Okay. Love to hear. One, yeah. So one, no phones, tablets in the bedroom overnight. And that's not just for teens, that's for everybody. So we know from just so much research, sleep labs and otherwise, that having devices in the bedroom overnight leads to less sleep Mm. and less quality sleep, Mm. lower quality sleep. So even if it's off, even if it's on vibrate, 
it's there. And almost everybody I talk to says that their, their phone is in the bedroom with them, usually within arm's reach. Yeah. Um, and then what I usually get is, wait, hold on. I have to have my phone in my bedroom overnight because it's my alarm clock. I have some advice for you. Buy an alarm clock. <laughs> yeah. Buy it on Amazon, on your phone, and then put your phone away and get a good night's sleep. Hmm. So I like that solution because it's very simple. It's relatively easy, relative, for most people anyway, relatively easy to implement. I made that switch four years ago. Um, would never go back. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know that there's some situations where it's not possible, but for most people, most of the time, that's a very straightforward solution. Mm. Um, the other is to just carve out times and places that are technology free. So family dinner, uh, family vacation, maybe, or the, the hour right before bedtime. So that, cause that's another thing we know from sleep research is looking at that phone before bedtime very psychologically stimulating, winds you up at a time when you should be winding down. Plus the blue light from the devices shines into our eyes, tricks our brains into thinking it's still daytime. And then we don't produce the melatonin, the sleep hormone that we need to fall asleep quickly and get a good and night's sleep. And is TV sleep. different so in blue other- light radiation from a your little smartphones? Bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great question. Um, so TV... It depends. So first of all, TV tends to be more passive and not as psychologically stimulating. Right. If you're watching TV on a traditional TV, as opposed to say a tablet, it's also farther away. So then you're not getting as much blue light as if you're on a tablet that's like right close to your face. So TV is definitely better than say scrolling through Instagram or something like that, or online shopping, you know, right before bed. Um, It does still have the blue light. One thing that you can do is wear orange safety glasses. Okay. So we have these in our house. You can buy them for like 10 bucks on, on Amazon. Um, and, and there's very, there's some that are really high end and some that are really cheap. And I don't know, I, I haven't yet seen like the definitive study showing that the $70 ones work better than the $10 ones. The $10 ones definitely get rid of the blue light. And you can tell because people who are wearing a blue shirt, it looks green and you peek, you can kind of see that it's blue. Um, so it, it, it does filter out, you know, some of that, that harmful, um, blue light. So, and you can, you can turn down the, um, the blue light on the tablet or phone itself. So, uh, night shift is what it's called on Apple devices, mm. but that doesn't get rid of all the blue light. It definitely doesn't solve the psychological stimulation problem. So it's not a cure all. You right. still have to think through, right. you know, how to, how to do this, uh, you know, a little bit better. So, you know, I think you can start there, you know, even if you're say completely, in, you know, addicted to Instagram, start with just not having the phone in bed overnight, then try to move to not looking at it in the hour before bed. And then you can move on to the hardest task of just limiting overall use, which I think is also a good idea. But those, those ones around specific times um, are probably even more impactful and also Hmm. easier to implement. So they're kind of the low hanging fruit. What is uh, one question about the generate the next generation that people should be asking that you don't hear many people asking? Yeah, there's a bunch. Um, So I think one is in terms of values. Um, I think that if you you think about how, I mean, just as one example, so one kind of practical example of how to market to or how to advertise to this generation, I think there's a lot of myths about what their attitudes are. And it's hard to choose one. I'll probably end up choosing a few. Um, one is, I think it's so commonly assumed that, for example, iGen teens are just like Gen X teens, but they're Hmm. really different. Um, for example, this thing about having overprotective parents, you might think, oh my gosh, iGen teens are going to say, forget that I'm going out of the house anyway, have huge fights with their parents that they're not on board with this. And it's the opposite. You know, they're often the ones who say, I'm not ready to get my driver's license. Yeah. Um, they fight with their parents less. Um, and they are very interested in safety and they're very, very risk averse. Hmm. And I think that hasn't been as understood. I think that's, you know, a huge opportunity for reaching them is understanding that aspect of their psychology that they um, just don't want to take risks. And it also means that if you think they're uniquely entrepreneurial, they're not actually. 
Um, mm. They're actually a little less interested in owning their own business than Gen Xers and Boomers were at the same age. Um, and it's because of risk. You know, it seems like too big of a risk to take. And, you know, that applies across many areas of their lives that whether it's a physical risk or an emotional risk or a financial risk, they're just not as willing to take those risks as previous generations of young people. Wow, that's a surprise. Good to know, because I've seen some hustle in the next generation and it's just good to to know what the data says. Gene, this has been fascinating. People are going to want to know more. Where's an easy place to connect with you and your work online? Yeah, so um, I recently revamped my website. It's www.genetwangy.com and there's information on there um, about um, some of the speaking engagements that I do because both virtually and eventually again in person, mm, yeah. you know, traveling to, um, to companies and speaking to leaders and um, you know, educational institutions and everything else. Uh, it's one of my, my big focuses these days. I try to put together a, you know, a fun talk on, on, um, on these issues and get into the applications for life and for marketing and for managing and, and all that stuff. Um, and there's also info on there about my research and books as well. Well, this has been fantastic. Gene, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. It was a fun conversation. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before. <laughs>